All right. Well, hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Uh, I want to welcome you back. If you've been uh, with us before, I'm Dr. Roney. And uh, if you're new to the cancer conversation, I want to take the opportunity to welcome you as well. We have a great uh, cancer conversation tonight. We have Dr. Elias here with us, who uh, many of you I'm sure know. He's, he's very, very popular in the, uh, I would call it the functional integrative cancer world. Is that accurate, Dr. Elias? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Keneally will be up in just a few minutes and uh, her and Dr. Elias are going to uh, pretty much sit, go through a lot of good information. They're gonna have a kind of a conversation back and forth. Uh, and I think it's gonna be really, really helpful uh, for you tonight. So as always, I'm gonna give you just a brief intro and then I'll introduce Dr. Elias and then Dr. Keneally come on, will come on and uh, we'll have a really good cancer conversation and a lot of great information for you. So let me briefly just go through. I know a lot of you that have been on uh, multiple times and many times uh, have heard me say this, but I think it's really important, especially for the new people coming on, to understand this philosophy and this plan of how to get well and give your best, your, yourself the best chance to get well in today's uh, you know, environment. So let's start with testing. Okay, so the testing that we do is in addition to the scans and di diagnostic studies and the lab tests that are typically done in the conventional model, but we certainly want to do additional testing to try to individualize the care to get you into a comprehensive individualized care plan, not necessarily just cookie cutter, but more individualized. So individualized medicine, uh, in my opinion anyway, is the future of care. In, the, in this uh, country and in the world, in my opinion. So the labs that we do, things like RGCC testing that sent to Greece or the Garden 360 test, or some of these other tests that help us identify the cancer tumor cells or the cancer tumor uh, cells that basically they're cells that have cleaved off the original tumor circulating around the bloodstream that if not detected and then reduced or, or uh, limited, could certainly turn into reoccurrence. So it's one of those lab values that we want to um, we want to do that aren't necessarily or isn't necessarily done in the conventional model that leads you to potentially a higher reoccurrence rate. So if we get that data and we understand it and they say, hey, everything's good, no evidence of disease, we certainly can start working on knocking those down to actually prevent uh, a higher chance of reoccurrence. The second part of this from a lab testing are some of the enzymes like nagalase as an example i'm only going to go through a couple because i think it's relevant but nagalase is an enzyme that's secreted by the cancer cell that essentially blocks the immune system from finding or attacking the cancer cell so if that's elevated it's a good idea for us to know it so we can knock that down right there's others phi is one that tells us about the the condition of the environment is it anaerobic is it aerobic so we want to know these things and when i say aerobic means uh, a cell using oxygen anaerobic cancer cells tend to use less oxygen and become more anaerobic and so if we identify those and we can uh, know and identify we can certainly knock them down to give your body a better chance right that's more individualized care those are just a couple examples, uh, but some worth mentioning. Then getting into what we call pillar two, which is the starve and the kill phase of cancer, right? So the starve phase can use some repurposed drugs to help block some of the pathways that feed the cancer cells. These are things like metformin, menbendazole, some of the statin medications, some of the parasite, anti-parasitic medications can be real helpful in trying to quote unquote starve the cancer. It's not, it's not actually that way, but this just, these things can help block some of the pathways. And I think that's relevant. The other part of, of pillar two is the kill phase. So the kill phase is what are we doing to, to actually uh, knock down these cancer cells or kill these cells? Well, that could be chemo, could be surgery, could be radiation. It could be immunotherapies. In our clinic, it could be a fractionated chemo or uh, insulin potentiated therapy is, is what it's called. And those are things conventionally, if you will, that can be done as part of the kill phase. However, there are also things in the alternative world, our world, that are also what they call cytotoxic or cancer killing, right? There's, there's things like vitamin C IVs and hyperthermias 
and modified citrus pectin can be a part of that. So there's a lot of things that are used naturally that can also be layered if need be uh, with the conventional type of care or instead of the conventional care. It really just depends. So these are things that, that can fall into that, that pillar two or the kill phase. Then we get into pillar three in our world. We get into pillar three, which is supercharging the immune system. I think that's extremely important. I think oxygenating the body, alkalizing the body is extremely important uh, for many reasons. And then finally in our pillar four, it's trying to figure out the causes, right? We have to peel back the layers of the onion and figure out what may have contributed uh, to the cancer in the first place. We'll look at everything from stress and hormones We'll look at uh, bacteria, viral, parasitic, fungal infections like mycotoxins and candida. We'll look at heavy metals, non-metal toxins, uh, et cetera. So that list opens a, a Pandora's box, quite frankly, and it's quite large. However, we wanna get into all of these things to give you the best chance to heal. So the idea is risk management. You mitigate the downside and you maximize the upside if you have a very, very good well orchestrated plan that you then find a clinic that can help you um, basically apply the details to the plan, right? And act upon them and give you action steps and actionable steps. So that gives you an idea of our four pillar approach. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Dr. Elias. So I want him to come up here. Dr. Keneally will be up in just a few minutes, but I want him to talk a little bit, give some intro, even on that four pillar doc and what you think about that. And, and, and let us know what your, what your insights or thoughts are. Yeah, of course, thank you for having me. I'm very excited uh, to, to be here and you have a beautiful center. Yeah, yeah, thank you. A Appreciate lot it. of new gadgets <laughs> and amazing dedicated staff and a lot of possibilities for the patients. And in integrative cancer care, there are tools and there are how we use the tools. That's right. And the more refined we are, the less tools we need. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to have more tools when that, you need them. That's right. And that's the beauty. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that your pillars describe, describe the process in a, in, a, in a very nice way. And when it comes to pillar number four, that's when we open into an endless universe. Because that's right. you talked about more of the infectious mycotoxin. I do a lot of work with mycotoxin, with pesticides, with glyphosate. I made it... Uh, a goal of mine to find a solution for removal of glyphosate that was successful. Uh, but it, this is where the journey of healing starts. So integrative oncology has a journey of trying to get rid of the cancer or stop the cancer or slow the cancer. It has a journey of healing. And these are parallel journeys that work together. Mm -hmm. So somebody can get rid of their cancer by doing conventional treatments while they are full of fear that is can be installed sometime by the medical environment, you know? Mm -hmm. So they get rid of the cancer, but their life quality really doesn't change. It's still great. They're going to live a longer life, but there hasn't necessarily been a journey of healing. Right. When we have the journey of healing, we give a different quality and taste to our life, to the life of the people around us. And as a result, it changes the way that cell behaves. You know, as you talked about metformin and changing the metabolism of the cell. Metabolism of the cell is affected by the way we interact with the world. Mm -hmm. this, the cancer cell is amazing. And when we look at a cell, a cell is actually an independent being. Uh, when I talk in like in my book, The Survivor Paradox, should have had the book here, but in, for people who didn't read it, it when I refer to cells, you can see I refer to them as having personality. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about the cell, it has a membrane, a boundary, right? Just like we have a boundary. Mm -hmm. We decide what comes in and what goes out. And within it, we have the mitochondria who decides what comes in and what doesn't come in. So the cell has a relationship with the outside world through its receptors. So if it's in a, in a survival, unhappy, fear-based, crisis-based state, it will put out receptors that respond to this. And this can be created by, just like you said, mycotoxins and heavy metals and pesticides and emotional trauma and genetic and epigenetic tendencies mm -hmm. 
and you know, and radiation damage and stress in life and emotional traumas. And now the cell has to react to them. And the moment the cell reacts to them in the outside, it affects the inside of mm-hmm. the cell. And then it affects our metabolism. Mm-hmm. So the beauty of it, and it's not easy, as you and I know, and, right. and, and Dr. Connelly know, the cell has a choice to become normal again, you know? Right. Every cell has a choice. We each have a choice and a potential to heal, and so does, and so does the cell. And that's the amazing uh, journey, and the amazing journey which we all have seen is that you never know how many veils you have to take off until the transformation happens. It can happen in a moment, right? It can take a very long time, and then things happen. So that's the journey of healing. And within it, there are a moment of fighting, of killing, like you said. Mm-hmm. And the process of killing is not easy. It has side effects. Mm-hmm. And there's this concept of trying to maintain balance when you kill. It doesn't work. You just want to kill more mm-hmm. of the cancer than of the normal uh, system. Mm-hmm. So you start creating a place where if the cancer is ahead, the cancer is here and you are here, and you start pushing the cancer down fast, and the health also goes down, but now suddenly the health is ahead of the cancer. And you can pick this change. It's part of the blood test you talked about, part of the energetic testing you do it, part of pulse diagnosis, many lab tests. Now the health is ahead of the cancer. Now we nourish. Now we jump. Now we can deal with things that are not directly related to the cancer, but are indirectly. That's pillar four. Mm-hmm. And it's always the balance. So it's interesting. It's not a linear journey. You see it in a 21-day cycle in chemotherapy. You try to kill first. Then when you give the chemotherapy, you want to make sure the medicine gets to the tissue, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever it takes. Then you start cleaning all the byproducts, and then you nourish, you balance, you prepare. So there are short-term cycles, there are daily cycles, and there's our journey through life cycles. And cancer is so remarkable in the journey because cancer is a disease where you have the person and you have the disease. And the challenge in cancer is that cancer tends to be independent. Mm. You know, it has its own regulatory system, right? You have blood, high blood pressure, you relax, blood pressure goes down. Mm-hmm. Cancer, it's more complicated. How can we translate a change in our attitude, in changing how we feel into a change in the way the cancer cell functions? Because often, as we all know, a cancer patient can feel better while the cancer is growing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We see this all the time. Mm-hmm. I always remember a terminal patient I treated and I turned him around. It was like years ago, one of my first patients, he was, he was a chiropractor. Right? Mm. And he had CML and he turned into what you call plastic transformation. Once survived, twice survived, you never survived after two times. Remember, he came to the clinic, I did some, it's a very simple thing. I was then working on the acupuncture license. I gave him homeopathy. He went into complete remission, unheard of. Mm. And then he went back to his home. He had to separate from his wife. She took him back and then she kind of kicked him out. Within 24 hours, I remember he left me a message. I was there with him when he left his body afterwards. He said, you know, he said, Isaac, I feel so good. How is it possible I'm going to die in a few days? Yeah. So he healed, you know, he's, but we use the healing energy as a way to overcome the cancer. And so it's a dance between the killing part and the nourishing part, like you called it, boosting the immune system. Mm -hmm. It's really whatever it takes for this body as an amazing, miraculous system of tens of trillions of cells to be together and to overcome the cancer. And then within it, you have your killing bout. And that's exactly what you do here from Mm -hmm. what you showed me, right? You have these different Mm -hmm. pulses of treatment. So it's beautiful when you have so many tools you got a lot of choices. That's a huge advantage. You, have you can layer, layer, such layer an amazing if, if they need it. Yeah, yeah that's a little, bit, a little bit broader an answer to you. Eh? Yeah, no, no, no. It's a great, yeah. great answer. Yeah. I love it. All right, so we'll we'll get into, um, I'm going to bring Dr. Keneally. She's waiting patiently here. And, and uh, I will get the slides up. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Keneally, everybody. So Dr. Keneally and Dr. Elias will, will take you from here. And happy Tuesday, everybody. Thank we'll you. talk to you. Doc, nice meeting you. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you, Doc. And we don't have to use the slides all the time. Yeah, true. That's hey, true. so happy to be with you. 
I got to remember to look at the camera. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We're so privileged to have Dr. Elias. And so um, I'm with, you know, I'm going to let him just dive in. So he's been here today uh, exploring our, you know, living environment where we take care of our patients. And as most of you may know, Dr. Elias is, has been doing this kind of integrative medicine for a very, very long time. So he's very familiar with his right brain and his left brain. In the medical world, they just use only their right brain, but an integrative doctor uses both sides and looks at all the possibilities. And that's what Dr. Elias's background has been, is looking at all the healing uh, mechanisms that can be involved in the healing journey. <coughs> and so I'm going to let him, because I want you to learn what we know and what is one big facet uh, of cancer. So go on and get started. Great. Thank you so much. So I guess we covered already the pillars. Yeah. Am I correct? Keep going. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, there you so a little bit about me. I have uh, close to 40 years of clinical experience. I'm a native of Israel, graduated from medical school Sackler in Tel Aviv in 1986. I also have a Master of Science in Chinese Medicine. I'm a licensed acupuncturist and uh, I have decades of training in mind-body medicine and I'm an active researcher published multiple peer-reviewed papers and have a large NIH grant researching the removal of galactin-3 in sepsis and acute kidney injury. So <clears throat> I wanted to start today by talking about the survival paradox. So what is a survival paradox? We are all wired and built to survive. Every cell in our body is built to survive. And the paradox is that what drives our survival is also what gets us sick, what shortens our life, and what causes us a lot of suffering. How is it possible? Because we are built to survive, every time we are under stress, every time there's an injury, there is danger, it can be toxin, it can be trauma, it can be different things, we respond. And this response is automated within us. So if I'll go back one slide. So when it's automated in, in us, the initial response is through the, <coughs> my apologies for the cough, it's through the sympathetic system. We either fight, creating inflammation, or we, or we flight, we run away. The running away causes isolation, we hide. So these basic patterns are automated and we can change them. We can take a deep breath, we can relax, and we move from a sympathetic system to a parasympathetic. A lot of your treatments, you do this. But then the biochemical system turns on by using alarming proteins, and they don't turn off so quickly. As a, as a result, you get the survival response moving to inflammation, moving to organ degeneration, and it creates a devastating cycle. And this cycle is relevant for so many illnesses, but specifically, it's important for cancer. So how is it done biochemically? Through a protein called galactin-3 that I coined. It's considered an alarming protein. I call it the survival paradox protein. It binds to different ligands that we'll see in a moment. It goes to the area where there is problem in the tissue and it delivers this ligands to the tissue. So for example, you see galactin-3 is free. It has a ligand, and these ligands can potentiate blood vessel growth, can shut down the immune system, can he help cancer cells to stick to each other. So once these ligands get attached to the galactin-3, they create a pentamer, a group of five galactin-3 that attaches to each other or to the cell membrane, and it practically literally creates a coating, a lattice formation. You can, in the gut, you'll call it a biofilm. You'll call it an arteriosclerotic plaque. But this environment right here between, uh, between the lattice formation and the cell, that's where the cancer cell creates its microenvironment. And our job, where well, Dr. Connelly worked so hard here with multiple methods, so some exciting ones today, 
is that it's to dissolve this boundary. Because in order for our medicine, in order for our approaches, no matter what they are, to get to the, to help the cancer, we need, we need to get to the target tissue. The target tissue wants to survive. It's gonna to try to hide. It's gonna hide by creating this lattice formation, which we need to melt. So elevated galactin-3 as a result of our, our survival response will drive inflammation. Inflammation will affect practically every organ in the body. Again, I don't want to go too much into detail into too many conditions, but it affects chronic conditions. In some of my current research, it affects acute infection and sepsis. So actually the things that can kill us in days are driven by galactin-3. For example, when a patient goes to the intensive care unit with sepsis, without any pre-existing condition like kidney disease, heart disease, or cancer, their level of galactin-3 time of admission will determine who is gonna die from sepsis later on in the ICU. Remarkable. It's especially important in cancer, which is where the main research on galactin-3 started almost 30 years ago, at least 30 years ago. So you get a sense of galactin-3 affects so many diseases. How is it possible? Because survival, inappropriate survival response drives practically every disease. And he, this is a biochemical messenger that affects this process. So really an image like, I like to make this image of a waterfall where you see different causes like trauma, injury, aging, infection, stress, they all create a release of galactin-3. And then will affect inflammation, cytokine storm, we're all familiar with COVID, immune dysfunction, which we talked right, one of the pillars was to try to reverse it, abnormal cell activity, which we have to eliminate in every way. And then you get your sepsis, fibrosis, cancer, biofilm, dysbiosis, and organ failure. So the goal is to try to, so what happens, we often try to target the downstream molecule. Many of the, of the medications in oncology, they target pathways which are late in the cascade. And I, the image I like to use is like trying to stop a waterfall by putting a bucket at the bottom. We're trying to shut it down at the top. And that's part of what uh, you, we were discussing early on about pillar number four, changing the causes, changing the driving force that, that starts this. So as such, galactin-3 affects so many conditions, organ fibrosis and failure, autoimmunity, uh, abnormal immune response, and of course, cancer progression and metastasis. It also drives a lot of toxicity, and that's why blocking it can reduce heavy metals and toxins. Now, how do we block galactin-3? One of my key discoveries almost 30 years ago is that a modified citrus pectin can block galactin-3, and by blocking it, it can attenuate the inflammatory process, the fibrotic process, remove heavy metals and toxins, and upregulate and normalize the immune response. So what is modified citrus pectin? Pectin is a long chain of carbohydrate, of galacturonic acid, about 100 to 300 kilo Dalton, so very large chain, not absorbable. It has a benefit in the gut, you know, it can bind to, 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 to toxin in the gut, can bind to some uh, cholesterol, but when we break it down in a very specific way to a very small structure and a specific one, and that's what pectosol does, it gets absorbed through the gut into the bloodstream, where it has its biological effect. It blocks galactin-3. And as such, when it blocks galactin-3, it dismantles the pentamers and it breaks the biofilm. And so the beauty of this compound, it, it removes an obstacle to healing, but it also down-regulates the inflammatory process. So often, for example, when people use binders, which is one of the properties of modified citrus pectin, you will have a, a reaction, a healing crisis. Here you don't have it, why? Because you are down-regulating the inappropriate immune response. So here we got our galactin-3 waterfall and we are basically blocking it at the top. And that's why we look at the study, let's say on modified citrus pectin and pectosol, 
over 80 published papers, you'll see studies on kidney and on heart and on liver and on lungs and on cancer and on, on so many fields because it's such a universal mechanism. So that's a summary of a different energy and I think a different benefits and key one that I didn't mention so far is the ability to support detoxification, to remove heavy metals, well published, the balancing and support of the immune system, it really improves NK cell activation and activity. So there are more NK cells, natural killer cells, but they also work better. And it synergizes with other treatments. So we really want to understand that we are trying to shift from a survival mode to a mode of balance of harmony. So modified retrospectin offers a simple help and support of a solution on a biochemical level. But we are multifaceted, multidimensional beings that function on, on all these other levels. And we want to really transform our, our inappropriate stress response. We want to transform our survival drive is actually hurting us. And we use different methods like meditation, breath work, being in nature, having support, being creative. Anything that allows us as people, anything that allows our community, anything that allows every cell in our body to feel safe, to feel in harmony, to feel loved actually. You know, there's a difference when we are like this, when we are protective, that's a survival mode. Cell is restricted, it can't, it's in crisis. It can't take nutrients compared to just the cell having an open heart, the cell being opened. And that, you know, so, I put a great emphasis on it at Metaba Medical Clinic, and that's the energy. What's unique about your center is that despite the fact that you have 70 people and so many different modalities, the quality of love and care permeates the air. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy to do in a busy environment. Yeah. That's really, so I really, I mean, it's maybe it's the key element that makes a difference, you know. That's true. Right, and this care is really what drives healing. And because to heal cancer, you need a team. Yep. It's, a, it's a multifaceted illness. Yes. So my personal uh, training for, for decades in meditation and healing and uh, taking long periods of time on my own for, for many, many years, I really believe in our infinite healing potential, in our ability to free the survival paradox. And it's a process. So this process where in the beginning, we are very crowded, we are very congested. One thought is attached to another thought. Our thought process is very sticky. You know, I was flying here for the meeting and there was, an, I think, a, some kind of a high-tech executive, young guy sitting next to me. It was like an hour flight, okay? And I could see how he was in the same time on the laptop and texting like crazy because he had the Wi-Fi. And, and you know, it, I mean, it's great he's doing something, but it, it made me sad, you know, he didn't have one space to, to nothing just to just be, you know? Mm -hmm. So this thing, you think that these are thoughts, right? But these are also cancer cells that are stuck to each other that are creating an isolation. So we need to create the space. We need to slow down. And when we slow down, then things that are deeper come up. And that's part of your pillar four. Mm -hmm. So infections come up, mycotoxins that are hidden mm -hmm. come up, right? Emotions and trauma comes up, memories comes up, amazing insights come up. And our journey is what, no matter what comes and how amazing it is, and this is specifically for the meditators among the audience, don't hold to what you experience. Because the moment you hold, you're back to stickiness. Mm -hmm. Whatever arises will always fall away. As long as we can be with the flow, anything and everything is possible. As long as the heart flows, we are alive. The moment the heart stops, we're dead. Our head, our mind is built to stop and analyze. Our heart is built to just flow and give and give and give. So the shift 
from stopping to flowing, that's the shift from hyperviscosity for turbulence to harmony and better blood quality and more better connection between the body and less creation of isolated environment that give rise to cancer. And this is where the answer really is. I call it open heart medicine. Mm -hmm. So the heart really is our ultimate healer. It holds the key to our limitless healing capacity. It's really the only organ in the body, like I shared with all of you today, it's the only organ in the body that is part of its survival takes dirty blood from all the body. It doesn't say I'm gonna take it from one organ or from the other. With open arms, the moment the heart doesn't accept blood through the venous system, we're in trouble. It purifies and transforms it through the universe, through our breath, and it gives it unconditionally to the whole body. And only then it nourishes itself. And it has its own divine force. Exactly. That we take for granted every totally. single day. Yeah, actually, it, and it has its own divine force. It has its own nervous system. Yes. And the flow from the heart to the brain is much greater than the flow from the brain mm -hmm. to the heart. And the electromagnetic field of the heart is 100 times bigger, which means how we feel. Now, if you're sitting right now, you just feel the energy of open heart. It's literally broadcasting to everybody around because the field the is world. big enough, including through Zoom, believe it or yes, not. Yes, that's correct. And that's part of each of us being a healer for each other. And obviously, it's not exactly where the world is right now. So it makes it much more powerful because when the sun is out, you won't see a small candle. But when it's dark, every small light is seen very well, you know. That's right. So it's a very little, and that's part of my passion. And I hope we can do something with it together where I can create a meditation and healing retreats in this area for people who come here and people in the area, because I've done it for so many years. I feel a responsibility. On one level, I just feel like I want to go meditate, but I've been trained for, which I will, which I do, but I've been trained for so many decades. I was I, I had the privilege to be the doctor and the student really of the greatest meditation masters in the Himalayas for many years. So I feel a responsibility to share this and to try to make a difference. It's, uh, as I say, it's my third act. Yeah. So I don't have your level of energy. <laughs> <laughs> so with this in mind, I want to thank everybody for, the, for, the, for listening and we're going to close the presentation and open the floor to questions. So this is, is there a, another one? Okay. Yeah. So this is for people who are interested in the pectus so we talked right, about. Right. Exactly. And why don't you talk because we've been using um, this a lot for biopsies and for surgeries. Okay. And talk right. about the studies and how that's right. so, so in, important. So in general, modified citrus pectin, in my opinion, I developed it, but I'm actually no longer financially involved with it. So I'm talking as a researcher now. It's really, I feel is maybe the most important supplement to take because it blocks galactin-3 and it changes the process. And I share today the results of our multi-center trial on modified citrus pectin and prostate cancer. And so the full dose for this is 15 grams a day and which every cancer patient really, it's a basic dose. If the galactin-3 is over 17.8, then they should take a, a higher dose, 20 grams. And for, right. people, for people who are healthy, they can take a lower dose. A lower dose, yeah. but there anyone would benefit, especially anyone. in the environmental because toxin. <clears throat> Galactin three adversely affects every single person. Right, exactly. So, uh, and here's the caps for right. people. There's powder and caps. So some people I know, Doctor Elias takes. Um, I the, take caps. My family takes powder. Yeah, so he <laughs> takes capsules just because it's easy. So I personally take capsule just because it's easy. Right. So. Um, and anyway, but it's, you know, we are talking about the arena of cancer, but it's also so important. Oh, yeah. A lot, a lot of the interest in this is in cardiovascular yeah, right. health, in kidney in health, and... in uh, removal of heavy metals, well published, even uh, different toxins. Especially if you are interested in removing pesticides and mycotoxins, you do this in combination with glyphosate detox, mm -hmm. which we just finished our study showing that we are reducing glyphosate levels, which was. You know, it's not the topic for today, but the glyphosate is, is a Huge. silent killer that all of all of us have in our blood. Everybody has Everybody. it in their blood and urine. So exactly. It's a very critical thing so to we, address. We finally, we developed a product that has data that can really remove glyphosate. Yeah. So glyph 
you got everybody knows about that. I, or if you don't, it's something you definitely want to know about. But we could probably do a whole okay. class on that. Okay, so for everybody, take a picture of this slide because this talks about new patient inqu inquiries. So that's nine four nine eight six seven six three say four. And then if you want to directly order anything. Um, the 949, that's the direct line, 949 And then the Center for New Medicine, that's for human optimization and uh, chronic disease, autoimmune, diabetes, heart disease, and everything. And that's 949-867-6419. So we'll be more than happy to take some questions. So how do I get, do I just press to the Q&A? Yeah. Okay, so can cancer stem cells be destroyed, whether holistic, integrative, or traditional methodology? So traditionally, cancer stem cells are not eradicated by surgery, chemo, or radiation, okay? Typically, they're, most of the substances are natural substances, and so that could be... Um, that I was looking at somebody said we couldn't see. So they can see us, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, can be anything from agaricus blase, artemisin, um, vitamin C, curcumin. I mean, there's a sundry of different natural substances. There are um, some medications. Now, Trexone is one. Uh, doxycycline is another that will eradicate circulating tumor cells. So we do customized testing to see how your circulating tumor, what your quantitative analysis of the circulating tumor cells, and then what are the best extracts to use. Now, the other treatment that I've been doing, it'll be eight years in August, is something called SOT, and that's support of an oligonucleotide technique, and they take the circulating tumor cells, they reverse engineer a new messenger RNA to disrupt the DNA of the cancer cell. So that's given back as one IV, and that IV will have a 24-7 stealth killing effect for about four and a half months. So, um, so that is, you know, how to deal with the circulating tumor cells. It's probably the fastest growing field. There's five articles written per day about the topic of circulating okay. tumor cells. So it's it's like an incredibly expanding field. Yeah. So this question is for you. Yeah, so it's no problem. I mean, an easier way for somebody. Question. There's a question when is it okay to open the capsules of MCP and put the powder in water and mix with the powder with stevia to reduce the stevia taste and how to use it for osteoporosis or high heart calcium score? What other supplements are good to go with MCP? Okay, it's a big question. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely, so if you want to reduce the stevia taste, it's cheaper and simpler to buy one pectosol with which is lime taste and one which is blend, blend without flavor and just mix them ff it's much cheaper cheaper than opening capsules and right and 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 and, and a much better way of doing it uh, for a for calcium score for high calcium score you really need to take the full dose of pectosol pectosol also chelates calcium interesting but that's not the issue you want to reduce the atherosclerotic plaque so you really have to take 15 grams. Good supplements to take together are a supplement that helps to dissolve clots and help viscosity like nito, like natokinase, lumbrokinase, serapaptase, Pedma Basic, an amazing Tibetan-based formula with, with dozens and dozens of paper, including a meta-analysis study on peripheral artery disease. And uh, yeah, so that's that's a, that's a good way to totally integrate it specifically for for uh, for helping uh, cardiovascular issues. And there was the next question is, what would be your best strategy to stay in remission from multiple myeloma? So you can say your part, and then I'll say mine. <laughs> yeah, so multiple myeloma is a very interesting uh, disease, and uh, the first part in staying in longer remission for multiple myeloma is not to identify with the idea that it's going to come back. Correct. That's the first and critical step. So, for example, I had a patient with, with active multiple myeloma that came to me, I think, about like 12, 13 years ago. 
at that time, CAR T cell was not available, you know. Right. Right, which is an amazing video about the brutal one, but you know, it really does a trick. And they came to me just after they did stem cell and the whole vocabulary was that, you know, it still didn't come back, it still didn't come back. Despite being spiritually open, there was, there was a set habit in the mind. And it took me a long time to change their vocabulary, their thinking while giving them supportive treatments. Uh, by the way, galactin-3 drives multiple myeloma, so modifies it to spectin, and especially plus inocule is very important. And multiple supplements, all the supplements that Dr. Canelli mentioned for regulating this, the circulating tumor cells, quercetin and curcumin and berberine and metformin, vitamin C, IV is very useful. Very useful. Very useful, specifically. So, so what happens, instead of the two years or three years, they were on remission from the stem cell, for seven years. And what happened in these four years is the CAR T cell came. Mm. And now they're going to be alive instead of not being alive. So it's very important. Don't buy into this idea that things have to come back right. because you are limiting your possibilities. And don't put a timeline. And then one of the secrets with multiple myeloma is to treat it on an ongoing basis. So even if you do a vitamin C IV every two months, or once a month or three months, keep doing it all the time. Don't stop the care. The other thing is that you want to look at the image of multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma is a very interesting disease is that it's hollow in the middle, right? The bone is hollow, which means something in our center sometimes is, is, is not strong enough. So you got to find your center. You got to find your core. You got, got to find what works for you. What is your truth? And you have to really go with it. And then I, I love treating multiple myeloma. It's one disease where I get really good results. In fact, I just told you got this story today about, uh, about multiple myeloma. So I hope it helps. But Dr. Connelly, please end. Right. Well, I think with, you know, you in the beginning, Dr. Roney uh, and Dr. Elias were talking about like all, like we're a miracle every day. And so we got to make sure our miracle is working for us. So we have to follow the rules and laws of how the miracle works. And then we need to verify with a integrative practitioner to, so they can sort out what is the, what is going on in, in the microscopic area. Dr. Elias mentioned about the the <coughs> mycotoxins and toxins and and all the different things so if we think cancer like a lot of patients think oh my mom had cancer this person had cancer oh so i'm probably going to have cancer so we pass on these same thoughts feelings belief systems and so we become what we think about most of the time and so we have to and i tell people a lot of times you're not so bad but the world we're living in today is very, very different than it was when we were young, okay? And then really different 100 years ago, very, very different. And our entire food supply, the air, the water, the food, everything. And then we have electromagnetic fields, which pose their own threat. So we just got to get create order in the miracle that you get to live in every day. And so... Fortunately, with the very sophisticated testing that we do, the bioenergetic testing, we're able to sort that out and you are going to execute the things that you need to do. And there's no finish line to health. So you're going to just be verifying that you're fine and you're okay. And well, what's the next thing? In the beginning, any cancer patient is completely overwhelmed. Today, I had a patient from Hawaii in the very beginning. She hasn't even seen me a year. And she said, oh my gosh, Dr. Kelly, I cannot tell you the transformation I've had from an emotional, spiritual to a physical. And now I totally get what I need to do and how I need to live and how I need to take care of myself. Because in the beginning, patients are very, very overwhelmed because in this country, we don't teach and esteem health as our number one value. And so we need to start from mothers that want to have a baby how to create the miracle that they would want to experience and take care of. But we've got to teach our mothers how to take care of these beautiful children that they're having. And then we need to esteem health and make that our number one value at home and in school. And so people 
we need to be verifying that we're healthy, but you can't go to a conventional doctor today and expect to think you're okay, because I see it all the time, because we are now practicing updated medicine. The way he and I practiced 30 years, years ago is very different than what I'm doing today. Right. And then every week we're learning <coughs> new things. We're learning new things. There's 1.2 million PubMed articles online per year. So what's online today is going to be in the textbook in 20 years. Right. But you're sick today. So you need we need we need to be working with people who are constantly surveying literature, connecting what is around the world, not just what's in the United States. The United States is only what for four percent of the population. Yeah. We need to be using, like he said, infinite healing possibilities. Right. And so we are, need to be seeking that out all the time. Beautiful, yeah. And uh, specifically for myeloma, remember the bone marrow is very active. It divides, it absorbs Constantly. toxins, it absorbs uh, lead, it absorbs heavy metal, it absorbs trauma. It holds our genetic material because that's right. That's where our stem cells are. That's where that's where we develop from. So a lot of so once you. Once you finished your active treatment and there is no visible myeloma, that's the time to change the milieu, to change the environment, to create a transformation. And the more you do it, the less you're going to follow the expected outcome. Because remember, expected outcome is based on habits. If we change our habits, the outcome will be different. What is a miracle? It's something that is unexpected. If we keep the same habits, we ain't going to have a miracle because we're going on the same road. Mm -hmm. If we change our habits drastically, we are obviously going to have a different outcome. And that's the power. And multiple myeloma really gives this opportunity. Right. Absolutely. So this question is, I have two low lipomas on my right calf. What causes lipomas? Can hormones cause lipomas? So I find that lipomas, which for the audience listening is a fatty tumor, and it usually happens as we age. And I personally think it's related to production of pancreatic enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, your, your pancreas makes enzymes to clean up garbage. Now he talked about modified citrus pectin cleaning up garbage. Absolutely. So those two things actually synergistically can really help. I don't think the hormones are causing the lipomas. Personally, I don't think hormones, your, your body was given hormones. So your body, hormones are the natural drugs to your body. So I think it's a metabolic imbalance of many different things. But what I've kind of found over the years is pancreatic enzymes with, you know, it could be circulation. It could be um, also um, stagnation of tissue and just an accumulation of garbage, which modified citrus pectin is very, very effective at, at eliminating. Yeah, definitely. In lipomas, again, if the, if the accumulation is not very toxic, you will have lipomas. If they become more mm -hmm. toxic, you will have a malignant tumor. So it's really a dance between helping our body, especially in this day and age where we are bombarded with so many toxins. Right. Definitely. So anyway, the next question, any recommendations on having surgical metal wire removed from chest from an emergency double pulmonary embolism surgery in the chest several years ago? Hmm. Hmm. Well, they probably need that metal. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, and it's going to yeah. be difficult to remove. That would be a quite drastic surgery. Yeah. So uh, I doubt that. Uh, arterial sill. There's two things that I use for vein health. It's arterial sill and something called endocalyx, which helps the, the endothelium of the art artery to be healthy. And baluque is very good to right. break up clots. It's excellent. So that's something you can take for prevention and very helpful in this day and time of, of COVID, et cetera. So, um, and it says there's something um, are just stuck there supposedly for life and make thermography scans look worrisome. Hmm. I don't know, that's kind of a, a unusual situation. So, but we can do some counterbalancing. So Dr. Elias has to go uh, catch his plane. So I will stay on. I would like everybody to uh, send your heart of love to Dr. <laughs> Elias. Thank you. thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. And for the great work. I hope to be back. Yes, we will. Thank you we everybody gotta, for joining. Yes, we've got to plan a healing transformation yeah, journey. Let's do it. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Have a safe flight. Thank you.
anyway, so um, a, the next question was about, will Ibu clean out those old blood clots stuck on interior sidewalls and veins for the double PE? Well, Ibu is very, very effective treatment for you know filtering out the blood and ozone. Uh, what I personally like to do is I like to, I take a supplement called Neprinol, N-E-P-R-I-N-O-L. It's a very, very good supplement to um, help have the blood flow like a waterfall. And so now some people take aspirin um, uh, also to take, but I like the Neprinol because it's all natural agents. Uh, so, but the other person mentioned bolioke that can lumbrokinase. So there's multiple things. And as you age, you know, your blood doesn't flow like it did when it was 15 and 20 years of age. So all of those things are very effective tools. Um, a patient asked if my naglase test numbers in the normal range, should I, still, should I still do the Bravo probiotic? No, you should be fine by not needing the Bravo probiotic suppository. And then in the future, you should get your Nagalase check to make sure it's still in the normal range. Uh, is Pectisol contraindicated at all with Mugus? No, absolutely not. Um, is RGCC the same as the CTC test? Yes, RGCC is a lab that checks circulating tumor cell test. Um, the question is, can thermography solely detect breast cancer when one breast shows results show suggested inflammation, stagnation, excess estrogen? So what we have to understand is that thermography is a vascularity measurement. And so it's assessing vascularity. Just because you have vascularity doesn't necessarily you need necessarily have cancer. And so if someone's, I always would do an ultrasound an ultrasound indicates lumps and bumps. Maybe it's not big enough to indicate a lump or bump, but you wanna get the vascularity down. I usually always recommend patients do iodine with coconut oil. A lot, of, sometimes I might recommend castor oil packs to the breast to reduce inflammation. Sometimes I use uh, uh, topical frankincense. Sometimes I recommend doing progesterone cream and then repeat that, um, that thermography scan in three to six months, depending on the situation. But you'll have, to go, you'll have to work with a medical doctor who can read the thermography and assess all the imaging uh, that's going on and not just rely on someone who is not a medical trained, medical doctor trained to do the assessment and look at everything. You've got to look at your hormones. You've got to look at everything. Uh, you know, when you, when we look at a patient, we can't just look at one blood value or one scan or one, you know, picture. We've got to look at the entire biological system. So the best test for heavy metals, well, I like to use the doctor's data blood uh, lab, and you can do a provocative test. A provocative test means you provoke the heavy metals. So you give IV EDTA and then the patient pees for um, nine hours and collects their urine. And then we look at the reflection of all the heavy metals. So because we're inundated with heavy metals in the environment, in every jar, baby food checked, uh, evaluated, they had organic and inorganic, and they both had heavy metals. So heavy metals are in the air, they're in the water, they're in the food supply. So taking something for heavy metal detoxification because heavy metals really interfere with the DNA replication. So they can be a great contributor to cancer. And so heavy metals are always important to address. Now, if you have mercury fillings, if you have mercury fillings, you have to have those addressed first before you do anything. So no testing, um, no IV EDTA if you have mercury filling. So that has to be addressed first. And then you can do testing with it. And then there are all kinds of different chelators. Uh, infrared sauna helps, obviously baths help that we always recommend. Um, but heavy metals are a big role, like in the fires, like the, they have these big fires now going on. There's much more heavy metals in the environment when there is a fire because they're stored in the in the leaves of the of the trees and plants and so they're released out into the environment so it's a good thing to probably take a heavy metal chelator i would say really on a regular basis the modified citrus pectin 
is great for that. And then you may need something else, a little help. We're just living in a time where, as Dr. Elias was mentioning, we're just in an inordinate amount of toxins for everybody. So on how, how consequential are heavy metal toxins for mercury amalgam fillings? Well, I always tell people go, go YouTube a, have a filling and you can see the mercury being released. And so mercury, um, if you send me an email, I'll send you all, well, I can send that, uh, Shep, we can send that. Uh, I have the scientific facts on mercury. So I would love to share that with you, with everyone um, that's listening or not listening, that is interested, but everyone should know about the scientific facts on mercury. So mercury is very, very, very toxic. All metals are toxic. And so we um, need to know what they do and why they're not good for us. But you are not born with heavy metals in your body, meaning you are, but you shouldn't be. That's not, there is no safe level of heavy metal in your body, all right, at all. And these metals bioaccumulate. So if you like, if you have a history of smoking, you'll have higher cadmium levels. If you have taken lots of MRIs that have used dye, the gadolinium, that bioaccumulates. So unless you take something to remove it, you're bioaccumulating these heavy metals over time. And they're stored in all tissue. They're stored in the bone. And like when someone they mentioned, talk about multiple myeloma, you want to make sure that you're, what your heavy metals are because they take over the bone tissue and the half-life of, for example, lead is over 10 years. So this is, this is stored in body tissues. And so you've got to take things and that's why it takes, a, it, you know, you can't get well in a day or two, you know, it takes time, but you are worth it. And it's something, if you don't change the condition uh, and the terrain and the soil, there's no way that you can prevent and, and eradicate disease. So, um, Patient asks, how do I increase white and red blood cells? Okay, she's going through chemo. Okay, so if you were our patient, we would be doing multiple things. So we always give our patients who are doing chemotherapy, we always give them something for their immune system, number one. Number two, a lot of times I like to use the peptide thymosin alpha. It's a peptide. Peptides are sequence of amino acids that correct an organ or gland. And so peptides have been around for a very long time. They are not drugs. They are, again, sequences of amino acids. And so they go and regulate a, or like I said, an organ or gland. So there's many, many peptides for all kinds of things, for your brain, for your immune system, for weight loss. I mean, many, many different things. But I like to use the thymosin alpha peptide. And I like to use that for people like, most people over 60 would benefit from that because our immune system, as we age, our thymus gland sits here, right here. And after the, in your twenties, it starts getting less and less functional for you. And so you, as we age, we need to take things that, you know, affect our immune system. And so, um, and cancer is a big immune system dysfunction. So if you have red blood cells, we usually have our patients take liver pills or they eat liver, one or the other. We don't give iron. We try to give this, the, you know, the nutrient or the supplement that will correct that. So one of those things, we use liver pills and, or like I said, eating liver to patients because liver is like a complete food and, and it has all the nutrients, phosphatidylcholine and all the other vitamins to um, help um, correct uh, the red blood cells very well. And especially patients notice a lot more energy within a, a day or two of eating liver. So, um, so it says here, the reason for asking the above is that after incorporating pectisol and Velasta, my light chains elevated. Hmm. There must be another reason. So, cause pectisol shouldn't do that. In fact, I'll talk to, uh, Dr. Elias because, um, I've never, I, I can't imagine that. And the Lasta is amazing antioxidant um, for anyone and everyone to take. I mean, exanthin is 
like this phenomenal master antioxidant that anyone would benefit from. So there must be some other factor because when patients diagnosed with cancer, they have tons of free radical uh, activity happening. And we all have free radical, but we seem to have see it a lot in cancer patients because we do nutrient testing to see what their antioxidants and free radical activity is. So there must be some other mechanism in place going on. You have another question, uh, Shep? Because I don't, oh, I, all right. Um, so the patient asked to diagnose, do I, to diagnose cancer, do you use gallery? Uh, what other tests are good? Well, gallery is okay. It's really new. It's the grail test. They, I think they have 50 different cancers that they screen, but that's not my preferred. It's new. I think, um, it can be probably something for more an advanced, you know, cancer, but I personally like the RGCC test. I've used that test for, I don't know, maybe a, a dozen years now, maybe longer. And I use that along with the bioenergetic testing. So, and then I look at your blood test when I order comprehensive blood testing. I can look for inflammation. If you have high hemoglobin A1C, I know that you're predisposed to cancer. So I have all these other markers that I use that have a very, very high accuracy rate only because we've done them for a very, very long time on thousands of people. And a lot of our patients come to us for prevention and early detection because cancer rates are one in two and exploding, uh, you know, at rapid levels more and more every day. And we're seeing younger and younger patients getting cancer. So the gallery, it's not that I wouldn't use it, but I would use it as just another piece of the masterpiece that we're trying to figure out. I wouldn't use it as a standalone for, I wouldn't feel comfortable um, doing that. I have done them on some of the patients, but I don't do it as a standalone test. So that's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Uh, how do you rid the body of circulating tumor DNA? So there is a lab um, called Signatera that looks for circulating tumor DNA, like in col colon cancer and breast. They're using it in a lot of cancers. I think that is a very good test to do, but that checks circulating tumor DNA. So tumor DNA from the tumor. So it doesn't check circulating tumor cells, which are the wannabe cancer and responsible for 95% of metastasis. So I would use those in conjunction. So the patients that we have treated, we do, again, we do an ent entire examination of blend panel. I check for circulating tumor cells. I also put them on intravenous vitamin C on a regular basis in the beginning. I, it's, I usually do it very heavily. And then I do the bioenergetic testing to look at everything else that we can't find in blood because you can't find everything in blood. Then we got to do nutrient testing because every cancer patient has deficiency of nutrients and they have an overload of toxicity. So if you don't take care of the basics and change the soil, the terrain, again, we can't create good, healthy cells that are going to fight for you. And so, so the circulating tumor DNA, going back to that, um, usually the patients for the first three months, I pretty much develop a plan and then I give them their home plan and they always have a home plan, but a lot of times after a while, the patient's able to manage it. And then they, um, have, um, uh, you know, what they need to do at home. And then we, I will be evaluating them every three, six months. The goal is to get to once a year evaluation because the patient's doing their self-care. And if you do your self-care, that is the trick. And then we can also be checking for the circulating tumor DNA. In the conventional world, they will recommend chemotherapy, but you can't just do chemotherapy because first of all, there's not a hundred percent slam dunk with chemotherapy. Again, you have to get to all the root causes of why you have cancer to begin with. Dr. Elias brought up about you know stress in conventional medicine they don't address stress 
So we have to address stress. We have to address toxicity, hormones, metabolic aspects, everything. So, um, but we're very successful. And it's interesting because I had a patient who um, saw me for colon cancer, young girl, 40s, with a couple of young children. And her doctor at, at City of Hope told her, okay, you do, your circulating tumor DNA is elevated, but he goes, oh, I'll recheck it. And so she came to see me and we've, she hasn't had an elevated circulating tumor DNA since she started with us. So she just did the, did the protocol, but I put her basically, she's on a home plan, just doing the stuff herself and then get period, periodic blood tests and not just circulating tumor DNA blood tests, but the other blood tests. We know we check tumor markers and D-dimer and C-reactive protein and all these other markers. So um, the next question was, um, patient was using Pectisol and they didn't feel good, but um, she thinks it's, I did, I think it's a detox and that's right. Sometimes patients, like I've had patients who do heavy metal detox, other kind of detox, and they are, feel terrible. So I tell them to slow down on their detox, do some gentler ways, like a detox bath with clay, maybe only take the substance once a week, give their body a break and then see how their body responds. But sometimes people can detox too fast and it's not good for them. So they can do infrared sauna. Sometimes people just need drainage remedies first, not do any kind of supplements for detox, just do drainage rem remedies, which are homeopathics, just mobilize the toxins to get out of the cell. And so, uh, cause some people are just too delicate or too sick to address that. So um, this patient does increase of galactin three with stress mean that galactin three increases driven by increasing cortisol? Yes, because we know increasing cortisol increases inflammation. So yes, that's a very good question. Um, this patient says, um, let's see. This patient, good eating. I've had a breast cancer tumor, two and a half centimeters for 18 months that hasn't grown. I've been following a um, special eating, meditating, and working on forgiveness. Conventional doctors want me to have a lumpectomy. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, I understand you've been growing, and I have several patients that you know, wait and wait and wait until. And so as long as they're under my care and they're, I, I know they're not in a danger zone, then I let them do that. But when you try things and you haven't, you haven't made progress, it may be time to do a lumpectomy. So let me explain to you about the anatomy of a tumor. Anatomy of a tumor is very complex, its own universe, as Dr. Elias was saying. So, and they're sending out growth signals to the body. So it's also affecting the immune system when you still have this lump. So I think long-term that it may not be a great plan to leave the lump in there. And then you've got to make sure just because you have a lump, how are you addressing the circulating tumor cells? How are you addressing the foundational root causes that created this lump? I think the idea of forgiveness and all of that meditation, everything is beautiful, but at the same time, you should be partnering with an integrative functional doctor who knows cancer and knows all the aspects of cancer and can direct and guide you so that you are not be, get into a dangerous situation. So, um, Someone asked, is it better to use powdered form? I don't, it doesn't matter. I think it's what you like. We were talking a bit at the doctor meeting today and some people like, oh, powder and they don't mind doing that. But I'm kind of looking, let's what, since I'm doing so many other things and I would rather just take the capsules. So, um, so it depends on personal preference. So, um, yes. So if you're just doing it for general um, health, I would just do five capsules a day. So, um, Richard, my darling, terminal melanoma 2010 is alive today. Use modified citrus pectin for all this time 
And what should his dose be daily? He took it three times a day. Uh, I think at least, you know, probably in this case, five twice a day, five capsules twice a day. So this patient says, my twin brother was diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma and literally had most of his scalp removed. He's an avid golfer and balding. How can I prevent skin cancer due to it running in my family? So one of the things I talked about is xanthan. And there is a great supplement now they make for prevention. I would be on high dose vitamin C. Um, and if you're, you know, you can use a topical vitamin C on your face or in delicate areas, uh, but basal cell can appear anywhere on your body. And, um, but xanthan is a very good skin protectant uh, also. And then also nicotinamide also prevents the, the development of basal cell cancers. So sunscreens, you know, we've been using sunscreen for a very long time. It's not preventing basal cell and squamous cell cancers. And then a lot of people use toxic sunscreen. So I'd be very, very careful about choosing your sunscreen. And if you're not out in the sun for a long period of time, I would not recommend doing sunscreens. So um, be very careful your choice. But I always tell people skin is an inside job, okay? It's not something, a topical thing. Um, and there are some very good natural things to treat skin cancers. So that are work very, very well. So I would recommend that you, you need to make sure that your internal biological system is working and you have the right nutrients and your detox and you're taking the right antioxidants because the antioxidants protect the skin. So um, I think um, it's, there's, you know, skin grows from the inside out. So a lot of people think, oh, I put it on my skin, but we got to think about what we're putting in our body so that we have good skin. So, um, so is modified sind indicated if your lectin three is normal? Yeah, that's why I don't even check the lectin three. One, it's never covered by insurance, but number two, um, it's good for anything and everything. So, and then if you're older, you know, fibrosis, I mean, like everybody is getting some kind of fibrosis in their body because of aging. So modified citrus pectin is like a vacuum cleaner of stuff. So even if your galactin is normal, it, it can be an, it can be actually artificial level. So I think it's better to just kind of thing in this day and time to be taking it. Um, how does it compare with vitality C that was recommended? Well, yeah, vitamin C is a different substance. So vitamin C, everyone, if you look at the work since they, I would say for the past 80 years we've done on vitamin C, it's probably some of the most profound work was Linus Pauling. And so um, I think vitamin C, there isn't a soul who should not be taking vitamin C. And what, so I mean by that is everyone should be taking so I give it, I gave it to my children early on uh, and when they were toddlers, because, you know, they'd go to school and get sick. So I would always use vitamin C. And, uh, vitamin C is the antidote to like heavy metals. It's the antidote for chemicals and toxicity. It helps your immune system. We're the only mammals who do not manufacture their own vitamin C. And it's because of our environment, I mean, I know I've said this like a broken record, but if you read what I read, then you would be saying the same thing and observing the same thing. We are living in the most extraordinary toxic times. It's indescribable what we're living in. But, you know, my job is to do all this research and homework all the time. And what I read every week is, is, is very, very abominable. And, but at the same time, we have the knowledge to manage it. And so, um, so we just have to take charge of our own health because going to an emergency room and or hospital, those are just for emergencies. For you need to learn to master your self-care and the people who master their self-care they don't have emergencies. They're, they're, they're enjoying life and taking care of themselves. That doesn't mean they're perfect. That just means that most of the time 
they have set up their 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 healing living environment at home and that's what you have to do um um so it says i don't know what she said about the ordering yeah we don't like silicone. one patient mentioned about silicone dioxide we don't like that either so we try to find things that don't have it so I, I appreciate that comment. It's, it's, you know, it's always trying to find things that don't, they don't put extra added ingredients. Um, and patient said, how many pectisol daily for remission? I would say at least, you know, five grams a day. So that's five capsules or one of those scoops. So anyway, these are all fabulous questions. And, um, these are all fabulous questions um, that everyone is asking. Um, people are, well, actually Dr. Lies came up because I personally have recommended for biopsies and surgery for patients to take five grams three times a day. So, and then a maintenance dose, I've been giving cancer patients five twice a day. Now, if you don't have anything going on, I would just do five a day. So. He's, you know, he's been researching this much longer than I have, and this has been his whole life is, is this. So that's what I learned today. So if you have active cancer, you probably need to be taking five grams three times a day. So, um, and if, and, but, you know, when you say active cancer, just because you have a clean PET scan doesn't mean there's no cancer. So people think because they have a scan that says no evidence of disease. And if you are just relying on just scans and you're not correcting the terrain of your body, then you're definitely not going to, um, you know, you're not going to achieve the success you want to until you've done a complete analysis of your, you know, personal inventory of your life and then your daily existence, the sleep, the water, the food, the purification, um, addressing every aspect. If you have yeast, like I, one of my patients today flew in from Oregon and I've been seeing her for like five years. And so she hasn't seen me for a year. And um, so she went, uh, we did blood test and then she saw Molly to do the bioenergetic testing. And she has lots of yeast. Well, we have lots of yeast today. There was a very famous book written. If you want to know about yeast, read the book, The Yeast Connection, written by Dr. Trowbridge. And it talks about the infiltration of yeast. It's very easy for any of us to have, have a, a yeasty system. And so, um, so, you know, people always go, oh, so if you've taken antibiotics, you're high likelihood of having yeast. Well, the problem with yeast or fungus, because those are the same thing, is that it's the same environment as cancer. And 85% of cancer patients, that's what's written in publications, is 85% of cancer patients have yeast. So if you don't deal with the yeast, you're still continuing the terrain of cancer. And so we have to unravel the terrain, the soil, that the cancer came in. So if you don't address that on every level, which conventional diagnostics, conventional medicine doctors do not, then you not, you're not going to, you know, assure yourself that you're going to be victorious in this journey. So um, there's so much written on this, so many different books, there's so many articles uh, and constantly changing. If you just look up the hallmarks of cancer, you'll see that doctors don't even address the hallmarks of cancer that are published in on PubMed and that every doctor learns about. So please don't take anything lightly. Don't take your health lightly. Your health is your most important asset, most important value. And it's not something that's easy to come by. And you do have to dedicate and put the work in to keep yourself healthy and to make sure that it's, it's going to work for you. And so, cause every day I see patients who, um, their cancer, they were diagnosed and never properly taken care of. And then the patients tried to advocate for themselves. And unfortunately doctors didn't listen to the patients. And so, and then they come here with stage four because people were not watching because so if you had cancer 10 years ago, 
you need to make sure you don't have cancer in 2023. It never stops. It just means, doesn't mean you become the problem. It just means that you verify that you're healthy and you're going to stay healthy. So with that note, uh, I, wanna, I appreciate everybody uh, participating in the cancer conversation. And I'd encourage you to share with your friends and family and loved ones. And uh, I'm proud of you for educating yourself because this is what it takes is educating, reading, and looking outside the box each and every day so that we all achieve optimal health. Okay, and Shep is telling me that we're gonna have a whole list of questions that we're all going to answer. And so stay tuned for more answers to your forthcoming questions.